Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to Grace once again, and uh, back to our study of things that differ and things that don't. This will be part 10, so we've had quite a few messages in, uh, in connection with these things that differ and things that don't. Uh, and I never did, I guess I never did put the A back in the word that on the second line. But anyway, we're going to be looking at a false notion in tonight's study, and uh, we'll, we'll pick it up from there. But uh, since we're now uh, three weeks removed from our previous Q&A Zoom room study. I thought that before we proceed any further, um, we might begin this lesson with a pop quiz of sorts. And no worries, there won't be any requested vocal responses and no test scores given. Just an opportunity to review some of the things we've discovered thus far in our studies of things that differ and things that don't when it comes to the present dispensation of grace under the stewardship of the Apostle Paul. Uh, and the former dispensation of law, while God's focus was solely on the nation Israel under the stewardship of Peter, during which, as you know, Jesus Christ was born and ministered. Uh, so as you probably know, and I'm sure the folks that are listening do know, there are some major differences in the economy of God, or we might say the operating system of God under Peter and the economy or operating system of God under Paul. However, we need to be very careful not to assume that everything taught by Christ and the 12 was totally different from that which was taught by the Apostle Paul, that they had nothing to do with one another. Uh, it's very easy to prove that assumption to be false, that, they, uh, that everything's different. So we need to be able to differentiate between the things that differ and the things that don't. So let's get on with our, uh, our short pop quiz, as I said, of sorts, <laughs> to show you what I'm talking about. Question number one, you might answer these on your own as we go through them. There are only three questions. And then go back and see how many you got correctly. And I would say probably most of you will get them all correctly, unless you have a different opinion, and that'd be all right too. <laughs> all right, the uh, I always have a little trouble getting my first slide to advance, but we will work on it here. Okay, question number one: How many churches that belong to God can you find references to in the pages of Scripture? One, two, three, or four? Uh, a lot of people would say two different churches. Um, well, the scripture answer is, sits here. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. For I am the least of the apostles, Paul wrote, and am not meet, not fit to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted, here it is, the church of or the church belonging to God. 2 Corinthians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints. Uh, which are in all Achaia. So it's fairly e easy to see here that the church of God, definite article, the appearing is specific church, the church of God uh, called believers or saints when pointing back to God's church prior to Paul's conversion is the very same, the church of God, believers again, saints after Paul's conversion. And who had come to faith through Paul's ministry? They're all in the church of God. So it was never two different churches of God if the Holy Spirit who authored scripture was speaking truth. Um, the invention of another church of God is a false invention of man. It's a false notion. God has never had more than one church, the church of God, over which God has appointed various stewards down through the course of time. So answer, answer question number one, there's only one church of God to be found in all the pages of scripture. Never two, never more. Not, and these are churches that belong to God. Uh, question number two, how many households of faith can you find mentioned in the pages of scripture? Answer one, two, three, or four. Well, some people would say two. Uh, that's really not the right answer as we're going to look at what uh, Paul says in Galatians 6.10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 3.26, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, so a person's children, we're children of God by faith, a person's children, that person's direct descendants, in fact, all of that person's expanded offspring are considered to be part of that person's household in the Bible. Uh, just as Jacob's descendants were considered members of the household of Jacob, the house of Jacob, whose name was changed uh, by God to Israel, those folks are the descendants of Jacob or Israel. This is where the expression the house of Israel in our Bible comes from. The descendants of Jacob are called the house of Israel 162 times in our Bible. They were called the house of Israel while they were wandering in the wilderness. Exodus 16, 31. 
They were called the house of Jacob or Israel again by the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Micah, and Zechariah. Christ called the descendants of Jacob the house of Israel in the book of Matthew. The author of the letter to the Hebrews called Jacob's extended downline the house of Israel in his letter to the Jewish saints. So the author of the book of Hebrews, fully aware of Paul's ministry, written long after Paul's ministry, and including a huge dose of Pauline doctrine in his letter, provides us with a list of the members of God's household of faith. It's only a partial list, too many he claims later on to number during time past in Hebrews chapter 11. You can read that list on your own. Paul comes along and tells us we are all children of God by faith. Uh, so we've mentioned this list several numerous times in previous studies. Only, uh, only one church of God and only one household of faith to be found anywhere in the pages of Holy Writ. If the believers of time past were considered members of God's household of faith, called the children of God in our Bible, and the Apostle Paul tells us that we are the children of God by faith, then God obviously only has one house of faith, not two, not three, not four more, only one household of faith to which all believers belong. This is the reason for the definite, definite article, the, appearing before the words household of faith in the Bible, and why the household of faith appears in the singular tense rather than the plural. The same is true of the church of God. If scripture is true, God has only one household of faith comprising all the children of God by faith, which means all the believers of all the ages. So the answer to question number two, there's only one house of faith, household of faith to be found in the pages of scripture. Let me give you question number three. This concerns the future coming of Christ. How many future comings of Christ can you find mentioned in the pages of scripture? Christ, speaking in John chapter 14, verse 3, said, And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And that is the word again in the dictionary is defined as a second time. Isn't that interesting? Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, verb tense, unto him that are looking for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation, literally deliverance, and we'll see what that's all about. Now, as I'd been taught earlier on, the letter to the Hebrews was not addressing the saints of the present dispensation, but only the saints of a supposed kingdom church. In other words, some would have us believe that this second coming really has to do with a third coming, not the mystery coming. Paul was teaching called the catching up or the rapture of a mystery church. But think about this with me for a few moments. And I'll give you five reasons why the letter to the Hebrews was not only written for the Jewish believers of time past, but is written for us as well. Reason number one, I'm going to give you five of them. The doctrinal content of the letter to the Hebrews. If the apostle Paul was commissioned to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. And if the epistle to the Hebrews is filled with doctrine that was delivered by the apostle Paul, are we to somehow assume that in some strange way, the author of the epistle to the Hebrews knew nothing at all about the message Paul was delivering? That Paul's message was a mystery still hidden to this writer? Better yet, why do the vast majority of fundamental theologians assume that Paul himself was the author of the letter or the writer, in, in other words, so reason number one why the letter to the Hebrews was an equally fitting for Gentile believers today is the doctrinal content of the letter. But there's a second reason. The second reason is Timothy's involvement with this, the, 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 the writer of this letter. Notice a statement made by the writer of, the, of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 23. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty? With whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Now, there's several re couple reasons he could have been set at liberty. He may not have had anything on his schedule. That would be one reason we could, we could read he is set at liberty. Another reason we could read that he, Timothy was set at liberty is Paul may not have been on the scene at this point in time. Uh, his death may have already occurred by this point. So Paul referred to Timothy as his own son in the faith in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. So the writer of this letter to the Hebrews had undoubtedly been a companion and fellow laborer with the Apostle Paul. As Paul again called Timothy, uh, the, Roth, the writer of Hebrews called Timothy, our brother. Some credit Barnabas, some Apollos, co-workers with Paul as having written this letter to the Hebrews. And as some of you may have noticed, the writer went on to say, if he, 
Timothy comes shortly, I will see you. So whoever wrote this letter would be traveling with Timothy. Uh, an obvious reference to the fact that the writer of this letter, whoever it happened to be, was a traveling companion of Timothy and as Timothy had been trained in the doctrines delivered by Paul. We see those doctrines, which was reason number one, the doctrinal content of Hebrews. There's a third reason. I'm going to give you a total of five. The timing of the letter. Now, this is important. Knowing what we now know about the writer of this epistle to Hebrews, the dating of the writing being around AD 64, toward the very end of Paul's lifetime, are we to somehow assume that this writer knew nothing at all about Paul's teaching concern? teachings concerning the coming of Christ and the catching up of the saints to be with Christ written some 30 years earlier? Are we to assume that the writer of this Hebrews epistle knew nothing at all about Paul's first letter to the saints in Thessalonica, the second two letters Paul ever wrote? Um, so you know, th this is important here. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 3 verse th 13 is where Paul said to the end, that Christ may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, not with the portion of his saints, not with certain saints of a certain dispensation only, but it's the coming, a singular coming of Christ, uh, a coming to be the second time he's going to come back, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, for we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not, and the word is literally precede them which are asleep. That's the definition, Old English prevent, precede them which are asleep. So Paul's letters had been written approximately 30 years before the writing of the letter to the Hebrews. And Paul's talking about the coming of their Lord. So the author of the Hebrews, we've already sh were showing here, I would fully have known of Paul's Paul's teachings. Twice more in this same letter, 1 Thessalonians 5 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Paul tells us the judgment seat of Christ will take place at his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by, here it is again, the coming of our lord jesus christ and by our gathering together unto him what is commonly referred to as the rapture the catching up of the saints and as you know paul used both the words coming and appearing in connection with the return of jesus christ to the earth that he was looking for an example being titus chapter 2 verse 13 we'll put that verse from paul alongside hebrews 9 28 paul wrote looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto him that looked for him shall he appear, mark it down, write it, underline it, score it, whatever, the second time without sin unto salvation, meaning deliverance in this case, which we'll see here. But if the author of Hebrews wrote some 30 years to write at the very close of Paul's ministry, after Paul had already written about a so-called secret coming and a so-called secret going of the believers, that author of the Hebrews would have already known it. The writer, the author, surely would have known it. Paul said that he had been looking for the Savior in Philippians 3.20. So it should be very obvious by this point that both the Apostle Paul and the author of the Hebrews epistle were talking about the very same coming of Christ, not about two separate comings, not about a secret coming and a secret going of the church. Um, so he's talking about the single coming of Christ. He's not talking about one coming for one church, another for a different church. I go figure where that idea came from, but I think we all know by this time. And as an even more compelling issue, reason number four, the author of the letter, not the writer, the actual author. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews had not been the author of that epistle. The author had been the Holy Spirit himself. So by the time the letter to the Hebrews was written, and as I said earlier, some 30 years after Paul concluded his letters, the mystery revealed by Paul and a supposed secret coming, coming notion would have no longer been a mystery. Therefore, the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of the Hebrews letter. He would have had no need to say that Christ shall appear the second time, not if the mystery was no longer a mystery by that time. And it wasn't. So if it was no longer a mystery, the Holy Spirit could have said he's going to come back the third time. So the Holy Spirit would not have led the writer of the Hebrews to say, in my opinion, he shall appear the second time 
knowing of an additional mystery coming of Christ that Paul had taught and which would have had many years earlier no longer been a mystery. You see, the mystery was no longer a mystery once Paul revealed it and God didn't intend it for it to remain a mystery. So by the time of the Hebrews letter, the mystery would have long prior been revealed. And God didn't intend to keep the mystery a secret when the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of Hebrews to write his letter. So it's easy to reason through. The Holy Spirit would have had no need to keep a so-called secret coming, a secret, when the book of Hebrews is written. Nor when John wrote the book of the Revelation, for that matter, which reveals a multitude of details about Christ's second, not third coming. Paul used the expression, this is the first resurrection. Not the second for a different church of a different time. He said this is a third. And Re Revelation is a final book uh, that we have in our Bible written last of all. So, uh, you know, when he said this is the first resurrection, I think we can take that at face value and say the Holy Spirit meant what he had John write down. Let me give you a fifth reason why the book of Hebrews and the term second coming when referring to the return of Jesus Christ was an accurate way of describing Christ's future coming to rescue his saints by catching all believers, including all those who will have already been deceased by that time, up into the air to be with him, i.e. the rapture of all believers of all the ages to take place at Christ's second coming. So here's reason number five, the body of Christ inclusion. What's that about? This is an extremely compelling reason why the Holy Spirit inspired the author of Hebrews to use the term second coming, rather than the words third coming, following a secret coming. What some of us have been led to believe is that members of the body of Christ alone are going to take part in Christ's secret coming, right? And the author of the letter to the Hebrews was written expressly for the Jewish believers of time future, not the body of Christ believers. That's why the expression second coming is used, some of us were being told and being led to believe. Is there any truth to that idea? Well, just reason it through with me. Have some of us, again, not been led to believe that all those who came to believe prior to Paul's conversion became members of a so-called kingdom church, not the body of Christ church. And therefore, those believers prior to Paul will not be included in the body of Christ church that will alone take part in Christ's secret coming. And the rapture meant only for the body of Christ, as some are saying. Who then would become members of the body of Christ church according to that viewpoint? Well, think it through. Why only those who came to belief after the apostle Paul. In other words, all those who came and will yet come to belief in accordance with Paul's ministry and message. Uh, but but think it through again. Will Paul's message not be a part of God's holy writ forever? Is Paul's message ever going to go away, ever going to disappear, ever going to be not true for some folks of time future? The answer to that would have to be only when God's written word goes away. His letters were recorded in God's written word. What does the Bible say about that? Well, let's take a, a quick look at just a few numerous verses that supply the answer. And there's, there's many, 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 but I just put a few here. First, the prophets. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand how long? Forever. Psalms 119.89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Yet the Hebrews letter was written after Paul's conversion and while the dispensation of grace was still in play. In fact, the dispensation of the grace of God continues even the day and will never go away as God's operating system with mankind. The law has been nailed to the cross of Christ, according to the Apostle Paul. What did our Lord say about the longevity of God's words? Let's go from the prophets to the Lord himself. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So Paul's gospel is not going to go away, folks. It will always be God's word, and it will be in God's word after um, it'll be, in, be God's word and God's true word, uh, even after the rapture and the judgment of people on this earth that are unbelie unbelievers. How about Paul? We see the prophets talk about God's word lasting forever. Christ did. How about Paul? Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 through chapter 4, verse 1, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, not some, not a portion, not only Paul's writings. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee, therefore, before God, Timothy, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead when at his appearing in his kingdom, his rulership. When he appears, he will be in charge. So, wow, there it is. 
Paul took it all the way to Christ's appearing, did he not? In the judgment seat of Christ. Peter, by the way, concurred with Paul in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25. But the word of the Lord endureth for how long? Forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Listen now to the writer of the letter to the Hebrews in a very opening of his letter, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in different manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So when was the Son manifested uh, speaking? When the author of Hebrews was, was talked about, uh, he spoke from heaven. So when did the Son of God speak from heaven um, to the Hebrews? <laughs> Paul's letters were being passed around, folks, but the writer didn't stop there. Notice verse 3, where speaking of Christ, this writer of Hebrews went on to say, who being the brightness of the Father's glory and an express image of the Father's person and upholding all things by the word of the Father's power, when he, Jesus Christ, had by himself purged our sins, Christ sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, where Paul and Peter both say he is today. And yet we're told that when the author said in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, some 38 years after Paul's writings, that somehow he wasn't speaking of the body of Christ when he said second coming. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto him that are looking is the verb tense. Paul said he was looking for him. For him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. When God changes in the manner in which he deals with men down through the course of time, he very clearly tells us of those changes in the written and completed word of God itself. He doesn't leave us guessing, and his word is true in spite of any man's surmising. The letter written to the Hebrews was written for body of Christ believers, whether some would have us believe otherwise or not. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand how many future comings of Christ mankind can now expect if we take the Bible at what it's saying. The word translated second coming is deuteros. How many can tell me, and you don't have to right now, but how many could tell me what the word, what word we get from the word deuteros? Well, we get our English word duo, meaning two, directly from that word. Had the Holy Spirit wanted us to know that God had a secret coming in mind after which would be a third coming of Christ, he could have had the author of the letter to Hebrews say unto them, they're looking for him, he shall appear the secret time. Uh, he could have even said the tritos time. As if he had been speaking the believers of a future time, the Holy Spirit could have said, and unto them that are looking for him, he shall appear the third time, the tritos time, from which we get our English word thrice. But he didn't. He said that Christ is going to appear the second time. So if we take God's word as being true, not listening to teachers, no matter who they may be, I believe when Christ appears and the judgment seat of Christ takes place, it will be at his second coming. And the third future coming is nowhere to be found anywhere in God's written word. This is why John, again, the writer of the book of the Revelation, said this is the first resurrection, twice in the final book of our Bible. And let me point out an additional important fact about Hebrews 9.28. Look at that verse once again. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto him that are looking for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto what? Unto salvation. Is Christ coming back the second time to save men from all their sins all over again? Not a chance. All the saving from sins has already been accomplished as the writer of the letter to Hebrews so aptly stated early in the epistle. So all that is left for mankind to do in order to be justified unto eternal life by being joined to the Savior, joined to Christ, is to believe Christ put their sins away at Calvary, where he bore the sins of the entire world upon himself and died accomplishing the putting away of those sins remember when you see the word salvation don't automatically let your minds go for salvation from sins the word salvation is simply means deliverance that's always the idea behind that word deliverance from what must be determined by the context in which that word appears christ jesus is indeed coming back the second time to deliver to save to rescue believers from the persecuting that Satan and dwelt Antichrist will be inflicting upon believers in time future. We'll be talking much more about that in our lessons to come, but, but the Bible says he's indeed capable of, of, of rescuing 
the saints, which, by the way, will take us forward to the book of Scripture called the Revelation. And as I said in previous lessons, we're going to be comparing three different writings about Christ's return to the earth to rescue the saints. We're going to explore first Christ's teaching about his second coming in his Olivet Discourse, uh, recorded in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through chapter 25, verse 36. Christ says much about his second coming along with Paul's teaching about Christ's coming in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, together with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53. You don't have to remember these. We'll be going through them. These are Paul's rapture passages, and we'll even include some statements by Peter. And finally, we'll include John's writing about the last days and Christ's coming to rescue his saints in the book of the Revelation. The goal will be to see if there's any correspondence any agreement and further elaboration about the very same thing, the very same issue in those teachings. Then what you'll have to decide for yourselves what you want to believe about Christ's return to the earth, the timing of that return, and the rescue of his saints that will take place at that return, followed by Christ's judgment on the unrighteous on that very same day. But first, to conclude our lesson for this, this week, I, I'd like to address something that was sent to me by an astute listener in our Zoom room studies, and I don't need to use his name, but he wanted me to see the writing of a now deceased major proponent, I might even say forerunner, of the two church idea in years past, who wrote an article entitled, Will a Body of Christ Go Through the Tribulation? So I'm going to read this to you, portions of it anyway, and, um, and then we can go back and examine it more closely. But he says, and these are portions taken from that article, uh, about a six, seven page article. We place our confidence in the word of God alone, and we are amply confirmed in our belief that the rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation period begins, and that the members of the body of Christ will thus escape the sufferings that the tribulation saints will be called upon to endure. You can see the two church idea all through there, can't you? The uh, This person went on to say uh, later on, um, he says, years ago, we printed an article entitled First the Departure, in which we dealt at length with the passage of Scripture, which does explicitly affirm that the rapture will precede the tribulation. Wow, I'd like to see that. In this article, we gave conclusive evidence that the words he apostasia and 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 should have been rendered the departure rather than a falling away. And the passage thus reads, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of the Lord, shall not come except the departure come first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The Texas Receptus, from which the King James Bible came, and every edition of the King James Bible way on back uh, of the lineage of the King James says Christos, not Lord there, Christos. But, of course, Darby said that was a mistranslation, but it's not a mistranslation in any manuscript that exists uh, from which the King James came. So here, the writer was taking his claim that the departure spoken of by Paul was a reference to the departure of the body of Christ at the rapture. So let's go back. I'm going to put 2 Thessalonians, the passage he's referencing here up on the overhead or up on the screen for you to look at, and we'll read through these verses slowly. Paul writes in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the King James translators chose the words of falling away. So if you are a King James only proponent, you'd have a problem with this person, this forerunner of right division, saying it should never have been translated a falling away, simply a departure. And you know what? He, he is right, because the words of falling away, not that they did a mistranslation, um, I think they knew far more than we give them credit for, is the word apostasia, which means a departure. Now, can there be, when we think of apostasy, we think of apostasy or a, a falling away from truth, a moving away from truth. And so the author of that letter, I just, uh, this article, I just was just reading to you. Um, he says that that falling away 
is the rapture. It's a departure of the body of Christ. Find that for me anywhere in this passage. And uh, so there's the con direct context is a falling away and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the day, the, the, the day of Christ, um, the day of Christ cannot take place which takes place at the very same time as his second coming, cannot take place unless there be a departure. We agree. We agree with this author that the word can be departure because that's what it means, a departure. It can be a departure from truth. And that will indeed happen as men at this time of yet future, when all these things start coming down, are going to their love for Christ is going to wax cold. Uh, and they'll be doing like Peter to escape persecution. But the falling away here, we can read a departure because it definitely is a departure. Let's keep reading. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. So they didn't have to learn them, uh, what this was all about from anywhere else but Paul. And he's a writer of, of scripture because Paul had already told them these things about, about what would take, be taking place. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. As we've seen in numerous studies we've done, the word withholdeth, let, and letteth is the Greek word kateko. It never means holding back, restraining somebody from coming to you, restraining somebody by holding them away, which is how, how this verse has been interpreted by Darby. Withhold is kateko, which always means holding on. In every single case, kateko is used, and we gave every reference in scripture. It's holding on to something, not holding something back. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what is holding on, that he that is holding on might be revealed in his time? When will the, the Antichrist be revealed in time future? when satan is cast out of heaven when a falling away does indeed take place when satan and his uh, minions have to do, to do battle with michael and his angelic host and satan is cast down to the earth and that falling away as i believe the translators knew full well goes right along with the prophecy of christ how i saw thee fall from heaven thou son of the morning prophetic perfect something that was yet to take place According to scripture, it will take place midway through the tribulation. So the direct context text of that falling away is that person that's withholding that he might be revealed in his time. That's holding on that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, Paul says. Only he who now is holding on, Kateko, will continue to hold on, Kateko, will let, until he be taken out of the way. Darby said that can be the body of Christ. That must be the body of Christ. And that gave validity in his thinking to a secret church and a secret coming. And then when he's taken out of the way, then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What happens when Satan is cast down to the earth halfway through the tribulation period? He indwells the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And the Antichrist then is capable of being empowered by the indwelling Satan to move into the temple and proclaim that he himself is God and do lying signs and wonders to convince the people of that day that he is indeed God, uh, even in the calling down of fire from heaven. Uh, so the, the departure is not the body of Christ in this passage, no matter how much they want it to be. The departure is Satan himself, which will have to depart and, and the writer of the article that I'm talking about even used some examples here that, that the word falling away, departure, apostasy, it simply means a departure. Luke 2.37, I'll just read a few of these. Depart, he departed not from the temple. Luke 4.13, the devil departed from him. Luke 8.13, in time of temptation, fall away. Uh, actually, there's 15 verses he uses where apostasy is used. And he says they all have to do with a departure. We agree. Luke 13, 27, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Um, Acts 12, 10, the angel departed from him. Acts 15, 38, who departed from them from Pamphylia. Acts 19, 9, he departed from them. Acts 22, 29, they departed from him. 
Second Corinthians 12, 8, I besought the Lord that it might depart. That's that thorn in the flesh. First Timothy 4, 1, some shall depart from the faith. First Timothy 6, 5, from such withdraw thyself. Second Timothy 2, 19, depart from iniquity. One more. Hebrews 3, 12, in departing from the living God. So yes, apostasy from truth is used in two, two or three of those, in fact, four, I think. Um, the reader should observe, this writer I'm referring to states, carefully that in 11 out of 15 occurrences, the verb in question is rendered depart, departed, or departing. We would agree with that. Only three of the 15 are concerned with departure from the truth. In two of these, it is clearly stated that the departure is from the faith and from the living God. While the third clearly implies a departure or falling away from that which was for a while believed, leaving the meaning of the verb epistemi in each case simply depart. And these are the only three passages of above 15 where departure from the truth is even involved. So you can't say it's not a departure from the truth as that definitely will be taking place as the love of some will wax cold for the one who purchased them through his own blood. So so, um, but, it, but he's drawing a conclusion that it's going to only be the body of Christ, uh, which cannot be true here. In Luke 4, 3, 4, 13, we read that the devil departed from Christ. The same word, we see that the devil is going to be departing from heaven itself. The stellar heaven says he's cast down to the earth and the Antichrist will be revealed for who he truly is at that very point in time. When, when uh, the fallen Satan um, indwells him, gives him his power and his authority, the Bible says, to claim that he himself is the Christ. Uh, so he gives other examples in Acts 12, 10, an angel departs from Peter. Um, in Acts 15, 38, we, we read how a man had departed from Paul and Barnabas. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8, we read of Paul's thrice repeated prayer that a thorn might depart or be removed. Who's going to be removed from the stellar heaven when he does battle with, with Michael and his angels? So the, we could definitely say departure is the idea between the falling away. But the departure is not the body of Christ so that the Antichrist Christ can be revealed. Uh, if the departure of the body of Christ had to be take place before the Antichrist could be revealed, that the body of Christ wouldn't have to depart until midway through the tribulation period. But anyway, um, we can see very clearly that the departure in a direct context is the one who is holding on and will continue to hold on until that one be taken out of the way. Is the body of Christ holding on and continuing to hold on until we be taken out of the way? Um, so before leaving this subject, the author of this article writes, we would call attention to Mr. Kenneth S. Weiss rendering of 2 Corinthians 2.3 in his expanded translation of the Greek New Testament. It reads as follows. Do not begin, he says, do not begin to allow anyone to lead you astray in any way because that day shall not come except the aforementioned departure in parentheses of the church to heaven comes first and the man of lawlessness be disclosed in his true identity, the son of perdition, which will take place midway through the tribulation. So the body of Christ doesn't have to be taken away three and a half years before the man of sin is going to be revealed. If the body, the only reason for his revealing is the fact that the body of Christ has been taken away. Um, so uh, he's, he's quoting a lot of things that are, he says are proof here that it's just his idea. Um, if apostasia and Apostemi meant what our word apostasy and apostatize mean. Why did Paul use that word in 1 Timothy 4.1? Why did he feel the need to add a qualifying phrase from the faith to complete the meaning? So therefore, then he, then he concludes with this statement. Therefore, in its original and pure meaning, unadulterated by the addition of other ideas I'm imposed upon by the context in which it has been used, means a departure. And he writes, it's a departure of the church, the body of Christ. So if it's a departure of the church, the body of Christ, and not a departure of the so-called and invented kingdom church, then we have two churches, do we not? 
we have to have two households of faith. We have to have two churches. We have to have two comings of Christ. We have to have um, three different resurrections instead of the two the Bible teaches. So this uh, Mr. We Weist, Kenneth Weist went on to say, the fatal mistake the translators made was in failing to take into consideration the definite article before the word apostasia, which appears, appears in the Greek text. So when it's talking about the departure, we can rightly be assured that the departure is the one that Paul said he'd already told them about. He'd already taught that to them, but they were uh, becoming fearful, thinking the day of Christ was at hand, which was going to take place the same day as the day of the Lord. So when that takes place, you see how Paul would, in his apostles, say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Why would they need to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling? Because there's going to come a time when the Antichrist, the man of sin, is going to be uh, persecuting the church. And the persecuting that he's going to do primarily is going to take place against Israel, the ones who are in that land that he didn't want in that land from the very beginning, doesn't want in that land today. And so the emphasis is, you see, the tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. So we have to look at the context. Um, he's, the writer of the article says, thus, instead of speaking of a departure of men from the true faith, Paul's referring to the departure of the saints to heaven. Is this departure of the church was preventing the coming of the day of the Lord and the disclosure of the man of lawlessness and his true identity. You see that I've invented a complete system here, a complete system that the professing church back in that day jumped onto this with everything they had because as the associates of, of uh, Darby said, it's, it's, a, it's an emotional uh, deal. It's an emotional theory that's been projected and the church bought into it. And it's an, also a prideful issue. Um, so the day of the Lord will not come then until the man of sin be revealed. No, the day of the Lord. Yeah, that's true because the day of the Lord is the judgment of Christ after he rescues his saints. And before he's revealed, there must be the departure. That's right. We would say agree the departure of Satan, not the departure of, the, of a body of Christ church. Um, so uh, we could go on. Paul taught these things. And the author goes on to say here, I'm almost at the end. And if it be proposed that the man of sin sitting in the temple of God and showing himself to be God is the apostasy, we must ask ourselves a question. Is this act on the part of the man of sin apostasy of falling away? Or is it blasphemous denial of the one who never at any time acknowledged God? It's a blasphemous denial. The falling away took place in order to make that possible, that denial possible. <laughs> so... Uh, and this is pretty conclusive. He writes, there is a departure concerning which the Thessalonians had been instructed by letter. No, Paul said he'd already taught that to them. This is not conjecture, but fact. It is the rapture of the church described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 17. He would say the church, the body of Christ that God brought into place to go along with the kingdom church that will have all their own things and none of the twain shall ever meet. Uh, so, uh, when we see that, we need to go back, and we're going to do that. We're going to go back, and um, we're going to see what the day of the Lord is all about, what the day of Christ is all about. We just review that very briefly. But we're going to go back, and we're going to look where Christ says so much about his second coming in his Olivet Discourse in the book of Matthew, primarily chapter 24. So we're going to take what he's saying there in the order of the events in which they occur according to christ those things are not going to not be true because it's for a different church of a different time they will be true and he will be coming to make those things true because that was the context what will be the sign of thy coming and paul talks about it and peter talks about it the author of hebrews talks about it. james talks about it. that's all through scripture so there's one second coming or hebrews isn't correct um so uh, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now is holding on will continue to hold on. Kateko, we can prove that until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed. 
whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Again, we're going to examine Christ's teachings about his second coming in Matthew chapter 24, this Olivet Discourse. We're going to examine Paul's writings about his second coming, the coming Paul was looking forward to, and the rescue, the rapture, the catching up to be with Christ in the air that Paul tells us will take place, the rescue of his saints, and he's capable of doing that. We'll look at that passage. Uh, we're going to look at several passages that point to um, the rapture, uh, the rapture of all the saints of all time, and we'll look at it in connection with the timing. We're going to look at Paul's writings about it. We're going to look at John's writings about it, and we'll We'll put them side by side to see that there is a corresponding nature. There is a correspondence uh, in the thing, things that are written by all three of them. So those are the three issues we'll be taking as we go through this one by one. And this will conclude our, our lesson part of uh, tonight's study.